Let's have one more prayer quick. Dear Father in heaven, God, I ask that you pour out your spirit on us today. That you speak through me and you guide my words. And, and that you speak to our hearts. Amen. If you don't recall, last year, this time of year, I was moving from um, being a little bit pregnant to very pregnant. <laughs> but you guys didn't really get to see that because we were like still on Facebook and live stream, weren't we? So you just saw like the top half of my face. And man, let me just tell you, the behind the scenes takes for me to do announcements I never realized how out of breath you get when you're pregnant. It took so many times where I was just like, "Case death, we got to stop. And I'm like, <sighs> and I'd said like one sentence. <laughs> and and I, as we were getting closer, I remember asking Mel, I was like, when do you want me to do my last sermon? Because I'm going to be honest, I don't think I can do them anymore. Because I can't talk. <laughs> it was just too much. But, you know, as you draw close to the end of your pregnancy and the due date, um, they told me I needed to prepare a birth plan. How many of you guys have done that? Right? What is a birth plan? So WebMD tells us that a birth plan is an outline of your preferences during labor and delivery. So, for example, um, you can put stuff in your birth plan like, who you want to be in the room, or what type of pain medication you want to use, even if you want the lights dimmed. um, You can include anything you think that will make your labor more smooth and more comfortable for you. So from what I understand, a few people have gone a little bit overboard with their birth plans. Um, Those of you with kids, were you one of those people? I've heard rumors. I don't think I was, but I guess you'd have to ask Seth and our delivery team. I I don't know. But even some celebrities have gone, like, way overboard with their birth plan. So, for example, Beyonce and I think her husband's Jay-Z. I don't know. They, you, yep, thank you, thank you. They rented the entire maternity ward for $1.5 million for the birth of their children. Yeah, um... Talk about a little extra, okay? Um, Then Mariah Carey and her husband, they scheduled the delivery and did a C-section, and, you know, they rolled up in a Rolls Royce, like, totally set. They're like, we got this. A couple hours later, rolled out with a baby. Not hours later, a couple days. Okay, those of you who have had C-sections, you're like, excuse me. (laughs) It is not a couple hours, let me tell you. Then Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt, they planned every one of their pregnancies to be delivered um, in another country. So uh, where was the first one? The first one was born in Nambia, and then the twins were later born in Nice, France, where they arrived by helicopter and stayed for two weeks, where they took up four hospital rooms just for their family. So, and then afterwards, they went back to this, like, villa in France. So they, the, the birth was an important thing. They went all out. And a couple people have even, you know, they didn't go so much so all out by renting out the entire maternity ward, but instead, you know, packed things so that they would have their stilettos throughout the process or makeup so they could be all dolled up and have video recordings and remember it and still look fabulous throughout the most unglamorous thing in the world. (laughs) Right? We plan births to an extreme. We have these crazy birth plans. Why all the extravagance? Why planning? Well, I think in the case of celebrities, they probably plan for two reasons. One, because they have the finances to do it. But two, because they spend their whole lives trying to get away from paparazzi that they do not want to have to worry about somebody sneaking in and getting a picture of them in their most vulnerable moment. So maybe that's why we do it. 
Maybe it's a show of love and celebration of this new life entering the world. Maybe it's a figurative inheritance, a tradition that's passed on from generation to generation. You know, an example of this is every Muslim baby that is born hears the same phrase. The phrase is, God is great, there is no God but Allah, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, come to prayer. Isn't that kind of cool? The, the one phrase that every Muslim child is born is this welcoming into the faith, welcoming into their religion. So maybe it's a figurative inheritance that, that we do. We have traditions around the birth process. But I think beyond that, the reason we tend to go overboard in our planning and our birth plans is because it is a sense of control, a sense of trying to guarantee success when so much is at stake, right? And you know, I I got some really great advice um, when we were preparing our birth plans from some of the experts in our church. And the advice was, the main thing you should include on your birth plan And the only thing that belongs on your birth plan is that, in the end, you want a happy, healthy baby and a happy, healthy mama. And nothing else matters, whether it's a natural birth or the lights are dim. That is the goal. So that was great advice. You know who you are. So thank you. Help me calm my mind. But... I can tell you that even though we didn't prepare our birth plan until like a month before Nevaeh was born, birth has been the plan for quite some time, right? You might have had these same conversations, but birth has been the plan that Seth and I have had since we were just a bunch of teenagers and we had that conversation. I was in high school still and it was the plan. Uh, we, we had decided then that two kids was better than one. And since that point in that conversation, our lives has been a decision, endless decision. Everything from the jobs we took, the places we moved, like here, the houses we lived in, all of those major decisions, birth was in the plan. For the last 10 years of me knowing Seth, birth has been the plan. And the same was with Jesus' birth. We talked about it already. Jesus' birth was planned years and years in advance. We see in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrath, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is ruler over Israel, whose coming forth is from old and of ancient days. Isaiah 6, 9, 6, and 7. We already read it. A great verse choice. Well done. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall fall upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. For the increase of his government and for the pe- of the peace there will be no end. On the throne of David over his kingdom to establish it and to end upon it with justice and with righteousness. From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And then Zechariah 9, verse 9. Rejoice o greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteousness and having self, righteous and having salvation in him, is in him, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the full of a donkey. And then Jeremiah 23, verse 5, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I shall raise up David, a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and execute righteousness and justice in the land. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff between his feet, until he, he whom it, shall, it belongs shall come, 
and the obedience of the nations shall be this. And lastly, Genesis 3, verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and your offspring and her offspring. He will crush your head, and you will bite his heel. Jesus' birth was planned from the moment we needed salvation. For thousands of years, this has been the plan. Much more than just the 10 years Seth and I were planning. Right? But my question is this. Why was it so poorly planned? Why? Why does the success of our salvation, it depends on his survival. But I would never dare give birth to my child in that time or place with all of those situations. Why was it so poorly planned? Luke 2 verse 4, starting there. So Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house of the line of David. And he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to the first or- her birth firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. I mean, we've all heard the history of Christmas. We all have heard this story, but when we stop to think about it, a stable, really? Like Joseph couldn't have had a cousin with a guest room? God couldn't have impressed upon the innkeeper's heart to build one extra room in the construction process? He couldn't have planned to place Bethlehem, not just a stone's throw away from Herod's man-made mountain castle. Like, he was a tyrant king. He was less than like 10 kilometers away, and he could just kill him in an instant. How many of you would have chosen to have your baby there? No. Why was it so poorly planned? Why? I mean... Everything depends upon the success of Christ surviving. Like, let's not even mention the complications with labor and then the mess of a stable, the the sanitary issues. There is so much at stake with this, and yet it's like God hasn't thought this through for the thousands of years. He had so much time to prepare. So why? Why? Was he intending for Mary and Joseph to have an intimate moment just themselves? Because if that was the case, he failed. He sent a bunch of shepherds, first thing, say, hey, look, in case you were having an intimate moment, here's a bunch of visitors. And then I'm going to send some wise men and they're going to tip off Herod, who's going to try and kill you. And let's not forget the drummer boy. I'm just kidding. (laughs) I couldn't help myself with that one. (laughs) Right? But it obviously wasn't that. But when you look at all the reasons to plan an extravagant birth, it seems like the only reason that God considered was that welcoming into an inheritance. You know? It's as if God is saying, I made this. Q slide. Sorry, this is the cutest picture ever. And I was like, this fits, right? God is like, I made this. Look, I put all these prophecies to say, look, this is my child. I have the angels singing down. I have Simon recognizing the Christ in the temple. I have the prophet Anna. I have the wise men. He's saying, I made this. This is my child. That is the only detail that God has considered. So where is the the guaranteeing of success? We can switch the slide. It's such a distraction. It's so cute. Where, Where is the guarantee of success? When the fate of the world rests upon this child's shoulders, where is that? So is it that God isn't really 
invested in the success of this mission? Could that be it? I don't think it's it because of multiple reasons. The first one being that it would look really, really bad for God. He just claimed this child as his own. You know, there's no disputing that this is the son of God. It sounds like a silly issue, but the reputation that God is upholding, that's the same argument Moses gave in Exodus 32, verse 11 and 12, where he says, why should the Egyptians speak and say he brought them out, of, out to harm them and kill them in the mountains? So the first reason why God has skin in the game is because it would affect his reputation negatively. The second is to be careless towards our salvation and the salvation of his people would be to confirm the serpent's accusations in the Garden of Eden. So Genesis 3, verse 4, the serpent says, You will not certainly die to the woman, for God knows that, w- that when you eat from this, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So, The serpent is essentially saying that God wishes to lord over mankind and he's purposely keeping us lower. And so to be careless towards our salvation, to think carelessly about whether or not it's successful, would be to prove that God does wish to lord over us, that he is indifferent to whether or not we survive or not. The third reason is that if the plan of salvation had failed, Jesus wouldn't have the power over death. Revelation 1 verse 18 says, I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and the grave. So Jesus holds those keys because of his success. So the opposite would be true, that if Jesus failed he would not have that authority over death, that our earthly death would be final. And the last reason that we're going to talk about today is that Satan would remain the advocate of earth instead of being dethroned by Christ. Revelation 12 tells us that there was a war in heaven, right? And the dragon and his um, associates were cast down. And a lot of us assume, oh, that happened at creation. But no, there's biblical evidence that suggests elsewhere, otherwise. So Job 16, I think it's not, Job 1 verse 16. Sorry, I have it wrong in my notes. Now the day came when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also arrived among them. And the Lord said to Satan, where did you come from? And Satan answered the Lord, from roving about the earth and from walking back across it. So here, we have this heavenly council where all the representatives of various places come to, you know, fill God in, essentially, in earthly terms. And Satan is the representative of earth at this point. This is post-creation. So when did that dethronement or when did that displacement occur? So when we read Revelation 12... We see, we'll just run through it because it's such a great chapter. Revelation 12. Then a sign, a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. And on her head was a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and screaming in labor pains, struggling to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven. A huge red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. And on its heads were seven diadem crowns. Now the dragon's tail swept away a third of the stars in heaven and hurled them to the earth. Then the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that he might devour her child as soon as it was born. So the woman gave birth to a son, a male child, who was going to rule over all the nations with an iron rod. Her child was suddenly caught up to God and to his throne. And she fled to the wilderness where a place had been prepared for her by God so she could be taken care of for 1,260 days. Then a war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but the dragon was not strong enough 
to prevail. So it was no longer, there was no longer a place left in heaven for him and his angels. So that the huge dragon, the ancient serpent, the one called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world, was thrown down to the earth and his angels among him. Then I heard a loud voice saying, Salvation and power to the kingdom of God and the ruling authority of Christ have now come because the accusers of our brothers and sisters, the one who accuses them day and night before our God, has been thrown down. But they have overcome him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of his testimony. And they will not live their lives so much, love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. Therefore, you rejoice in the heavens, all who reside in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you. He is filled with terrible anger, for he knows he only has a little time. So a lot went on there. So let's recap. So we have the revelation rendition of the nativity scene, right? The child is born. Then we know that he has been victorious over sin because of the cross. Then he is swept up to the earth and displaces Satan, now becoming our representative. See in Hebrews 8, chapter 8, the whole chapter is just fantastic, but we're just going to read verse 1. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, no one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Oh, one who is, not no one. Sorry, that is a very bad slip. (laughs) So one who is seated on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent of the Lord, not man. So Jesus, after success, now becomes our representative, now becomes our high priest, removing Satan as our representative. So to fail would have meant that God's throne room, would, that Satan and his angels would continue to have sway in heavenly courts. So God certainly has invested interest in the success of this birth plan. So why was it so poorly planned? Why does it seem like God threw out the success portion and put so much to chance? Because Jesus' lowly birth is a statement that even when God himself comes down, He does not seek to lord over us. That God, with all his resources, with all his great majesty and stature, becomes the lowest of us. Because God's glorious humility is so central to who he is that even though it is the one thing that was originally questioned, he must No matter what it costs, he must maneuver uncertainty in order to orchestrate the ultimate rescue mission. God is a God that does not wish to lord over us, to keep us small and lowly, but rather he becomes lowly, to be as lowly as we are in order to elevate us to himself. John 1 verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as only the son of the father, full of grace and truth. Galatians 4 verse 4, but when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, under the law, to redeem those under the law, that, they might, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, and, the, and since you are his children, oh, spirit who calls Abba Father, so that you are no longer a slave, but God's child, since you are his child, God has also made you his heir. This was not a careless poorly thought out birth plan. 
This was a deeply intentional mission to reveal the matchless love of God. Our heads for closing prayer. Dear Father in heaven, God, help us to remember your grace, your mercy, and your humility. But most importantly, your ultimate love for us. That whenever we doubt, we are reminded of that. And throughout this Christmas season, that we remember your love for us. And, and how much you risked for us. Please walk with all of us throughout our week. Be with us in our struggles and draw close to us. Amen.